I'm Marcel Ziswiller. I joined Toradex in 2011. I'm going to leave this June. I spearheaded the embedded Linux adoption uh, by uh, introducing upstream first. And at times we were top 10 U-boot and Linux kernel ARMSOC contributors. We have an industrial embedded Linux platform. It's called Torizon. And it's fully based on mainline technology. Mainline U-Boot, Distribute, KMS, DRM graphics, and over-the-air update with OS3. And the application layer is uh, containerized with Docker or Podman. What am I covering today? I'm going to introduce Bluetooth. We're going to have a look at the specification. I also quickly talk about security. Then I'm going to compare a little bit the low energy with the classic. And then we have a look at the Bluetooth stack, also the Blue C, which is the mostly used Linux Bluetooth stack. Then I'm going to look at some of the Linux kernel Bluetooth uh, controller drivers that are upstream, also how that can now be integrated if you have an embedded Linux uh, system. And then we look a little bit at audio because that is a, one of the main use cases with Bluetooth, not with uh, Blue Alsa, which is kind of a lean solution mostly used in embedded devices, but I also quickly going to have a look how that works on a cutting edge distribution nowadays, like this silver blue stuff I'm running here, for example. And then also I talk a little bit about Bluetooth debugging. If you have an embedded system where you have some Bluetooth problems, how you might address that. And I will finish it with a live demo here, okay? So Bluetooth, it's a short range, low cost, easy to use technology. It basically was invented to replace cables, not? So nobody expected it, but the 3.5 millimeter headphone thing actually did disappear, not? There was outcry at the beginning, but it's it, it's gone, basically, not. And it operates within the unlicensed industrial scientific me medical in the ISM band in 2.4 gigahertz. And with that, it, of course, has also danger of interference. Also, Wi-Fi is there, for example, or other interference stuff, or microwave ovens, things like that, not. That's why it uses frequency hopping spread spectrum. So it usually performs 1,600 hops per second. So it, it uh, jumps around in the 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, and with later specifications, it does that in an adaptive way. So it basically avoids any kind of interference stuff in this hopping sequence. So it can hop basically around in the 2.4 gigahertz, that is, is not congested in, in any way, not. And packets are transmitted in, uh, data is transmitted in packets, and basically each packet is transmitted in one of the 79 channels that, that the 2.4 gigahertz is divided in. And then each channel usually has a one megahertz bandwidth, and it uses Gaussian frequency shift keying modulation in, in basic rate mode. There are also other modes in Bluetooth 2.0 plus EDR. So it was an optional part, the, the EDR, the enhanced data rate. The, they introduced differential quadrature phase shift keying, uh, which allows in EDR2 mode to have two megabit per second, and it uses eight DPSK in EDR3 uh, mode, which allows three megabit per second. And chips are usually fabricated in, in RF CMOS uh, 
technology. Then, like I said, it's a standard uh, wire replacement uh, protocol. We also, it's low power. We see here in the table, uh, there are Bluetooth classes and how many milliwatts and that translated to DBM that they're allowed to actually use. Not. And it allows for ad hoc connection, voice or data transfer, and it's a wireless personal area network standard, basically. That, that means it's, it's really confined to around the person. Not, it's not really meant to, to go hundreds of meters. At least the original standard was like that. But of course, the range depends heavily on, on multiple factors, like uh, you know, whether you have anything that is blocking it. Also, we saw there are different uh, modes, speed modes, so it also depends on that, of course. And also on the protocol class, whether classic or low energy. And, and then the, the Bluetooth class, meaning the transmit power that can be used. And of course, also on the other end, the sensitivity of the receiver. And at the end, also, of course, antenna technology, how they are aligned to each other and all this kind of uh, RF stuff. Not. Quick history. So initiated, it was in 1989 by Ericsson Mobile up in Sweden, in Lund. And they basically, the, the real principal development on it started in 94. And by 97, they had a somewhat workable solution. And then what happened was that IBM was also looking for some technology to integrate into their ThinkPads to allow them to communicate, not? However, back then it was deemed too power hungry to, to really integrate the kind of the long distance, whatever technology into a notebook. So they somehow agreed to integrate this short link technology. So you would just hop from the notebook via mobile, go, go get your uh, yeah, internet connection, something like that. Not? At that time, neither IBM nor Ericsson was really a market leader in this kind of uh, technology. Not? That's why they agreed to make this short link technology an open standard. And that's, that's how it basically came along. And then, so Ericsson contributed uh, this technology they were working on, the short link. And IBM contributed uh, some of their patents they had more in the link layer. Uh, around the link layer. And they knew that that will only work if they can recruit some more kind of uh, technology companies. So they recruited Intel, which then in turn also got Toshiba and Nokia to join. So in 98, the Bluetooth SIG was basically founded, the standard interest group. And they launched with five members at the beginning, Ericsson, IBM, Intel, Nokia, and Toshiba. And then in 89, the first devices were coming to market. And they, with a mobile headset, they earned the best of show at the Comdex. And the first mobile phone that had Bluetooth technology was the T36. And then the T39 made it to store shelves in 2001. And the Name Bluetooth was actually only kind of a code name, but yeah, I would say as usual marketing kind of failed to come up with something better. So they just went with that. And kind of interesting in 2012, the uh, job Hartson from Ericsson actually got the European Patent Office uh, Inventor Award for, for his work that they did. At that time not. So the Bluetooth special interest group, that is really the non-profit, non-stock that stands behind the standard. Nowadays, we saw they start with five companies. There are more than 35,000 member companies. So it's very used everywhere. Not They oversee the development of the specification. 
usually every like year or other year they uh, refresh it, not so it's quite active still. And they also manage the qualification program and protect trademarks and they meanwhile have a full network of applicable patents around this technology. And by becoming a member, you basically can license that to qualifying devices. I will not go through all the specifications here. The, the early ones were not really interoperable. All the later ones, they are quite keen that they stay interoperable, the devices. No? I mean, kind of backward compatible, of course. Uh, one interesting thing is, like I a little bit mentioned, Bluetooth 2.0, that was when the multiple uh, data rate modes got introduced. Then in Bluetooth 4.0, they introduced, uh, a, actually under kind of marketing name, Bluetooth Smart, they launched the uh, low energy stuff. No? And the latest one that came out uh, like uh, last year, it's now uh, Bluetooth 5.4. Okay. A quick word about security. Uh, of course, I mean, Bluetooth, the advantage is it's, it's rather short range, so you cannot exploit it like over high or big distances, not. And as such, it's deemed fairly secure. However, especially older devices, and remember, it's, it's kind of backward compatible. And, and the, if you would still use some of the older early spec stuff, that is really deemed not very secure. Especially the whole pairing sequence is kind of easily to, to interfere with and, and exploit. A lot of this got addressed in Bluetooth 2.1 and uh, also, of course, and th that is also what m most, for example, mobiles do. You kind of, uh, you don't always are discoverable and all this kind of stuff or even disable it if you don't use it. Not that, that way it cannot be exploited. However, even the latest versions still have some kind of security problems. For example, you could easily do a denial of service attack with, with some kind of uh, uh, pairing request, things like that. So if somebody would want to exactly now pair something, you could basically easily DDoS that. Then two attacks that also got kind of named is blue snarfing. That is when you would use Bluetooth connection to steal information or blue jacking. That is when you would send some kind of unsolicited stuff to some devices. That was at times also quite a popular thing. And even last year, end of last year, actually, it's fairly recent. There were some new unpatched vulnerabilities discovered, and that's even in the low energy uh, part. And this is up to now, uh, like I said, unpatched. So Bluetooth really has basically some security problems, but yeah, as it's only used in this short range stuff, I guess it's, it's not that bad. Then BLE versus Classic, not? so it was introduced in spec four. It's basically a new incompatible stack and uh, it is meant for very low power consumption. Uh, it uses 40 channels of two megahertz rather than the 79 one megahertz ones in the original spec. It increased the CRC to 24 bit rather than eight or 16. And it can now handle unlimited devices, while before it was uh, limited to seven active slaves. It is lower cost, otherwise maintaining similar communication range. And initially they had a 500 kilobit per second mode, later uh, five 
spec also introduced a two megabit per second mode. And there are now dual mode or single mode implementations. So you could basically, usually the, the host side is usually dual capable, not, I mean, a mobile phone usually can talk to classic, older stuff or low energy. While there are certain uh, devices that, for example, in, in the smart home or something like that, that, that only support the low energy uh, spec. And for that, there is also a very lightweight link layer that, that can really provide ultra low power uh, idle mode. That way you could uh, have devices with coin cell battery that, that run multiple years. Not. Of course, it depends at the end uh, how many minutes or hours or whatever you actually really transfer data. Not. Then the Bluetooth protocol stack. So we have a link manager that is for the establishing the connection between devices. It authenticates the link and configures it. And uh, yeah, also allows management stuff. And then it is using the services from the link controller. And supported services there are of course data transmission and reception. Also that uh, there is a concept that you have a name so you can discover stuff, not. Uh, you can request the address of the link, partner, and then, like I said, the connection, authentication, and the mode negotiation. And then the host controller interface, HCI, that is ba basically the command interface in between the controller and the host. Then the logical link control and adaptation protocol, L2 cap, that multiplexes basically multiple logical connections and it can segment and reassemble uh, the on the air package. The basic mode payload is up to 64 kilobyte and there is like a 672 byte default MTU and there is a 48 byte minimum. Then there are retransmission and flow control modes. So it allows for isochronous data or reliable data with retransmission and CRCs. Then later specs also introduced enhanced retransmission mode, ERTM, and they provide reliable L2 cap channels. A streaming mode, that's basically without uh, retransmission. So that uh, paired then with flow control uh, allows unreliable channels and the, re the reliable ability is, is optional also in the lower layer with uh, BDR or EDR interface. And uh, what is special, so the number of retransmission and the flush timeout, so the Basically, how long it waits doing this kind of retransmission that is all configurable. And uh, then it's also service discovery protocol, SDP, so that allows to discover services offered by devices. And of course, the parameters that are behind what, what is offered. One interesting thing is the so-called radio frequency communications, RFCOM. It's basically a pure cable replacement of the uh, RS-232 serial port. And uh, especially at the beginning, a lot of uh, devices were, that way you could easily convert something that, that used to use a regular cable serial port, you could convert it to Bluetooth. Then some other protocols is, for example, the network encapsulation, BNAP, that is basically, uh, yeah, it just transfers data on top of an L2 cap channel. Main purpose is usually IP packet transmission. 
Then there are audio and video control transport protocol that's used as a remote control profile, basically to carry commands from audio video kind of devices over an L2 cap channel. And of course, you can also transfer the audio or video data. That is the AVDTP that allows, for example, the advanced audio distribution, the A2DP profile to stream music in, in a good quality, basically over a L2 cap channel. Then one other one that never really took off, it's more or less historic, is uh, the telephonic control protocol. That was more or less some of that, this initial thing, but nowadays uh, nobody, or, yeah, nobody ever really adopted that. Then there are also a lot of protocols from other standardization that basically got adopted and are used in, in, with Bluetooth. For example, PPP, or like I said before, with BNAP, that, that you have TCP IP or UDP stuff. There is the older, from IRDA, from the infrared times, not the OBEX, object exchange, or even the wireless application environment, wireless application protocols, WAE or WAP. So how does that look in Linux? In Linux, we have Blue C since 2006. There, in the older times, there, there was even from Nokia some kind of a stack, but that was never used anymore since 2005 or around. Blue C itself originated within uh, Qualcomm. One interesting thing to note is that nowadays Android doesn't use Blue C anymore. They actually rely on fluoride, which uh, was formerly called Blue Droid. And that is a different stack that was developed by Procom. And the stack has user space daemon and utilities around it. And also in the Linux kernel, there is Bluetooth subsystem. Uh, you find that in uh, net Bluetooth. And it also has accompanying uh, uh, drivers that those are to be found on the driver's Bluetooth. And it kernel supports that since version 2.6. So ha let's have a look at the controller drivers. There are various interface protocols supported. There is, for example, the HCI via SDIO. Then there is HCI via UART. There are various incarnations, so many companies, Procom. There are also so-called H4 or H5 variants, while the H4 is kind of a regular four-wire UART, so RXTX and RTS-CTS. There is also a vari variant called H5, which is a three-wire variant. So you could basically come uh, along with one less signal. There is also a low-level spec that was mainly used uh, for Texas Instruments chips. Then Intel, Marvel, Qualcomm, Atheros, and also Realtek have their own incarnations of the UART one. Then also USBs is quite frequently used, not also the USB one. There are incarnations kind of from the various companies, Procom, Mediatek, or Realtek. Then there is a special driver for Marvel Bluetooth stuff, which has also an SDIO variant. This supports, for example, all these uh, uh, nowadays NXP chips, which we also use in some of our modules, not, for example, the 8997. There is a similar SDIO one for MediaTek chips. MediaTek also has their own HCI UART driver. There is a Qualcomm one for SMD kind of interfacing. And there is a new NXP one, which we actually now also uh, uh, migrated to. It's called BT NXP UART. 
There are also a bunch of obsolete ones. I was just curious, had a look at the K-config stuff, what is lingering around. I will not go through that, but this is some historical things like some of the old Nokia mobiles had some special H4 plus mode and so forth. Not, and of course, various of these early Bluetooth companies changed hands meanwhile. For example, Red Pine, I remember we also used at the beginning when I was at Toradex that meanwhile went to Silicon Labs. <coughs> So let's have a look what vendors even have upstream support and how does that all kind of look like. Uh, remember I was evaluating for some of our later uh, system designs all these various uh, options. So for example Broadcom, they actually uh, don't really market any stuff on their own anymore. They sold it off multiple times to, uh, yeah, I, I wrote that here actually. So Infineon, formerly Cypress, not, is one that got some of their stuff and also Synaptics uh, later bought some of Broadcom's uh, Bluetooth uh, or Wi-Fi Bluetooth technology. I'm not really going to cover any of the Wi-Fi part here uh, for at least uh, Wi-Fi 6 or 6E I also talked about once in uh, Austin. You can find that talk online, I guess. So Procom, the newer ones, they support Bluetooth 5.3 or 5.4 via UART as well. And for my testing, I usually used M.2, 2230 form factor uh, kind of uh, cards. Not. The Linux driver for that is the BTBCM and the config also BTBCM. And you also need firmware for most Bluetooth, also Wi Fi uh, stuff. You will need firmware that then actually runs on this device, not which, of course, the firmware part is not really open source in that, in that sense, which is one of the little troublesome pieces here. If, if in open source we find some kind of issues, not it's you cannot you will have to kind of convince one of these companies to actually go figure out what in their firmware is wrong and whether or not they might uh, fix that not. Uh, in the black terminal box, I have how it looks when you load that kind of uh, stuff and also with HCI config, what kind of information you get. Another driver is the Intel one. It's actually very frequently used, not it, up, up to a few years ago, it, that was more or less the de facto thing you had in a notebook, not? Unfortunately, on the Wi-Fi side, it's a little bit different because they don't really allow that you could do anything with an access point mode, not. but that we're not really going to talk about here. The Bluetooth part is fairly yeah, mature, of course. The driver is BT Intel config and also firmware required. And again, how that looks when you load that. Then Another upstream contender is Mediatek. There is the Philogix 330 or 360 with Wi-Fi 6 or 7 uh, functionality. But here we talk about Bluetooth. It has 5.2 or even dual 5.4 support. Unfortunately, that later Philogix 360 is uh, still very, very new. And there is very little known about it, and I have not had this one in my own hands yet. But uh, MT7922, I tested uh, extensively, and that uses BTMTK driver. And again, how that looks when you load it. Then another one, NXP, which I'm also going to use in the demo. 
it's, for example, on the word in AM62, this is the top module shown here, the little uh, Wi-Fi module there, the, it's IW416, which is kind of a new uh, thing from NXP, but it uses older technology. So it's more or less exactly what a lot of us embedded Linux or IoT kind of uh, uh, yeah, users are using. No? It supports Bluetooth 5.3 via UART. Then, uh, yeah, the, the upper one, this is kind of a proprietary footprint. It's called MyBlox Maya. And the lower one uses an N.2.12.16. The Linux driver, like I said, is, uh, the newer one is BTNXP UART with the config also BTNXP UART. And you can use it uh, with either separate firmware, so UART IW416, or with the uh, yeah, combined firmware. I will talk about that also a little bit later. Then another one is Qualcomm. Qualcomm has, of course, also uh, a wide range of uh, devices supporting Bluetooth 5.3 or the latest one 5.4 as well. It's the BTQCA driver and uh, this they call the firmware stuff, actually, they call it RAM patch. And that's how it looks when you load the uh, Qualcomm phone. Then, last but not least, Realtek also has uh, interesting chips that support this technology. For example, the RTL 8852CE or later RTL 8952. Again, the, that later one is rather new, not too much uh, known yet about it. It's the BTRTL driver with a company config and the firmware for it. Let's have a look how that can look on the integration side if you have an embedded Linux system, not. This is an excerpt from one of our uh, schematics with this Maya IW416 based uh, one. So on one hand, of course, you have the Bluetooth interface. Uh, here it could be SDIO. Actually, here the S if SDIO is used, you could also have it shared, uh, so-called multifunction. Uh, so you would really use the same interface for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, which in our kind of experience, that of course can also cause some problems. And you can also use uh, UART, as I mentioned earlier, usually it's RXTX and RTS-CTS. Quickly going back to the schematic, that will be on the right-hand side, upper uh, corner, not well, on the left side, it's the SDIO, which actually is used for Wi-Fi. Then USB would be another uh, way to connect. Uh, I talked about that last year in Prague. So if you're interested about how to do USB on embedded Linux, that talk you can also find online. Then also there is a uh, the PCM stuff for audio available. However, uh, while that is used heavily on, for example, mobile phones, and they really do it mostly, for example, to save more power, this cannot easily be used usually with embedded Linux as you would require a special firmware that would even support that. At least in the NXP case, this is how it is, and so far I'm, I don't know of any customer who, that would have succeeded to actually pull that off. I mean, you would need a really big project and convincing NXP to, to provide you that firmware or not. Then another thing are, of course, the control signals. Usually you have some control signals for power, 
for example, a PD, power down signal, that is connected yeah, usually to a GPI or not. There might be reset signals. In our case here, the BT reset and WLAN reset would even be separate, but it wasn't used in our design uh, because we, we were just controlling the power to it and it has a power on reset, but then you don't really need separate resets. However, I will show later that this also causes some kind of issues. Another kind of signal would be for strapping. So you can tell the module where which interface it even uses and especially also there is some kind of a boot drum also on the device where it expects the firmware from. Not. Then usually there are wake signals and th those usually go in both directions so that the host can wake the device or the device can wake the host. Not. Other kind of signals is for coexistence stuff that would allow if you have uh, also like an LT uh, thing on your system that you could actually make sure that they don't contend for some frequencies and uh, airtime. Not. How does that now translate to the device tree? So this is the upstream kernel org device tree for the word in AM62. Actually, this is only the part the DTSI that is relevant for the Wi-Fi SKU. Of course, we have SKUs with or without that assembled, so different ones then apply. So you see here, like I said, for the power, there is a power sequencing thing. It uses this MMC PowerSec simple uh, driver. And uh, we basically, even though this is the Wi-Fi enable power signal, it, it uses, uh, yeah, that's just because that driver calls it a reset, but as we have seen in the schematic, we, we're not really connecting that to reset, but rather to the power side, and then it does a power on reset automatically. Then, while I'm not going to really talk about Wi-Fi today, this is the SDHCI part, so the SDIO. Uh, we also see here, that is where you hook up this PowerSec stuff. And then for Bluetooth, it's using the UART. You can see here that you usually specify that it has RTS, CTS, so it knows that it has to use the UART in this four-wire mode, not with RXTS, RTS, CTS. And usually you have a separate Bluetooth. Uh, node where you here that's the compatible that is actually applicable for the IW416 for the BT NXP UART driver. And like I said earlier, this is just basically a refresh of an old chipset, that's why it uses the 8987 uh, compatible here. I mean, it's quite common in Linux that you don't introduce new compatibles for, for every new thing if it's just uh, still compatible. Not. And one special thing that is a difference to the old 8987 here is that it starts immediately by default with the 3 megabolt. While the original 8987 I think started in 115 kilobolt and then you had to do this nasty switching, which also caused a lot of problems. Then, like I said, one thing where SDIO also is relevant is for the firmware loading. So you could have dedicated firmware. So you would basically Bluetooth and Wi-Fi would load each their separate firmware. However, the way we now wired it, when we don't have separate resets, that doesn't really make fully sense because you cannot really kind of start over separately with either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. You always will anyway have to power up the whole thing and everything starts uh, again. That's why usually it makes more sense to use the combined combo firmware. And also this has the advantage that you can use the faster interface, basically SDI, to load the entire firmware block node. However, 
we discovered that that can cause an issue in the load order. So if the UART driver would load, uh, yeah, the UART module would load first, it of course would kind of expect the firmware to be there, respectively try to then load its own firmware. But if you want the combo firmware, that's not what you want. And this can be worked around uh, just via, via mode prop stuff. This is how we usually do that on, on our systems. And that way you avoid this problem. Not. Then let's have a look also at the audio stuff because that is a, a fairly common use case. So Blue Alsa is basically the rebirth of the Blue C and Alsa integration. So in the older Blue C versions uh, before five, that was basically part of regular Blue C. They then dropped that in favor of third party uh, yeah, applications that do this audio integration. And that's Blue Alsa is basically one of the third party ones. And of course, on the distro side, they usually use a more full-blown solution. But for, for embedded devices, this is a very lean uh, middleware between the audio application and the Bluetooth audio profile for, for such devices. And it's, like I said, status quo alternative for, for like embedded stuff. And it supports the same Bluetooth audio profile as, as a full-blown solution. It also has much fewer dependencies, which is, of course, uh, usually makes life easier for your embedded system design. And it's also acting at the lower level in the software stack. And it does register all the no known Bluetooth audio profiles with BlueC, and in theory, th so they should all the yeah, devices that are out there with audio capability should be able to connect to that. This is how it looks like. So they have their own Blue Alsa daemon, which also talks to the regular Bluetooth daemon, uh, which also talks then to the device. And it supports uh, these various uh, profiles. It would also support uh, Alsa MIDI stuff which in cert for certain devices is still widely used. Not. So it's, like I said, especially for an embedded system, and it allows audio streaming. And uh, otherwise it, of course, is constrained to the regular ALSA IPA, as it's not using any kind of more fancier option. Not. Bluetooth, Blue Alsa daemon is the heart of it, and it handles the whole connection and configuration, everything. And also, of course, under the hood, it's using DBUS, just like the regular Bluetooth stuff also. And the way it does that is with so-called Alsa plugins, which hide all the DBUS specifics, and that allows that you can use regular uh, PCM uh, yeah, mixer stuff, for example, as with other ALSA stuff, and also seamless uh, MIDI handling. So the daemon registers uh, org blue ALSA on the DBUS and then handles the pairing connection and using of the device. It relies on the regular high level. Uh, Bluetooth pairing and connection procedure that the uh, Bluetooth control, for example, allows you to do. And the plugins, they create vi virtual also uh, PCM devices, and they can be used by any application that knows how to do PCM device stuff. Uh, it's basically a PCM IO plugin. However, it doesn't associate a sound card with it, and that you will also see that uh, it doesn't have a uh, uh, kernel proc interface for it. So it's a purely virtual thing. Not it's, it's, I mean, it's a software thing. Not. But it does allow uh, playback and capture with the minus D device Blue Alsa. So that means it's using the Blue Alsa plugin thing. 
And it also allows A2DP, high quality audio, or HSP, HFP uh, profiles via SEO links for like phone type connection. However, Blue Alsa itself doesn't do any of the uh, kind of a, a call feature integration that you can optionally do via Ovono. So you can, when you compile it, you can specify, uh, or, or when you do it with Yocto, you can have, a, uh, you can also specify that. Part. Then the more full blown would be Pipewire. I'm not, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to talk about these details more here. But Pipewire and uh, Wire Plumber, that's basically how that all works in, in a full blown distribution. If you want to do that on an embedded system, it's also pro uh, possible. So, the, here, how you would build something with the Octo project that uses uh, the full blown stuff. And make sure to it basically, when you have multiple such third party audio applications, they will content. So you have to also remove the blue ALSA if you want to do uh, full blown uh, wire plumber pipe wire stuff. Okay. And then another thing is some of this. Uh, 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 basically codecs that are used with especially high-end audio, they, they have some licensing things which you might want to have a look at, which for example here you can just say accept license flag commercial, then it would build it with all these codecs. I just didn't want to mess with whether it would not work or something like that. But of course for a real device you would have to make sure that that you know what you're doing with the licensing or not. Then a quick word on debugging. Uh, yeah, make sure to find a good reproduction scenario. That is one thing. So with automated testing or scripting or something. And then it's mainly about figuring out where in the stack your problems are. On the low level, Firmware, hardware, you can usually check either the UART or USB or whatever communication you are using with a logic or protocol analyzer. And uh, then don't forget also the, to have a look at the control signals. Sometimes we have seen some glitching on those control signals can also cause problems. No? And then one can analyze the actual HCI communication and that can be done using uh, BTMON and th this is a tool that is available in the Blue Sea user space stuff and uh, that one a little bit inconvenient thing it writes not only to a file but also to standard out so it's really hard to kind of pipe that in a way that you could uh, yeah live run that then to a Wireshark or something like that on your host not while, while for example with use USB mon that is possible to do but I have not figured out with Bluetooth that, that cannot be easily done so usually I just trace it to the device and then just copy the file back and you, you have to do basically uh, you can't do runtime analysis is you have to do it afterwards not but Wireshark allows to visualize it here I show uh, a Wireshark session on the top you can see it shows you where the communication comes from from the host or the controller and you can just like usually with Wireshark you can uh, look at what exact data you have and what exactly it's doing not in the lower Compare windows, I have the RX and TX that were captured on the actual UART, even lower level than, than HCI. So without even knowing what it is, it's just the bytes that are transferred on, on the UART, for example. That way we were able to figure out whether the problem is some kind of uh, yeah, corruption just on the bytes on, on the UART. Very good, then let's have a look at the demo here. I 
show what parts are used. Actually, I'm not going to use the Shelly because that stupid thing emptied its coin cell battery. And I heard some rumors uh, that's probably because it runs an old firmware version. They fixed that meanwhile, but updating that firmware is not entirely trivial. But when I'm back home, I will try that, of course. So I will, will use the lower one. It's just some like $1 kind of Bluetooth audio receiver board that I once got off AliExpress. And then I pair it with our carrier board. It's a Dahlia with a AM62 SOM. Or you can do the same also, for example, with a, either the MX8M Plus. I just see that I have a typo there. I will fix that and upload uh, slides for that. Then let me switch to that. Actually for that I quickly change here to mirror mode, otherwise it is kind of uh, very inconvenient. Okay. So. That would be that. Can you all see it? So that is the wrong one. Why did it not go to mirror mode? <laughs> now. So. So that would be so this is the window where you see the UART and this is my notes. I think this should do it. So let's fire it up. Then I also have here this other hardware. I will plug that in. So that is blinking away. And we are booting here. <coughs> so I can log in. We can have a look. It's now down. Remember RF kill. So it's blocking it by default. I'm going to unblock the Bluetooth. Let's have a look. Now it should be running. So it's up and running. And you see it's Bluetooth version 5.3 that it's running here, not. Then we can go to Bluetooth control and we can basically scan. I'm curious, probably there are so many Bluetooth devices here. Let's see <laughs> whether that will work. So, yeah, that, as we kind of expect, plenty of things that when you do a scan, it, it, it sees lots of stuff, not? And this HWBT, yeah, it already went on again. I could, of course, scan off. Oops. Anyway. It is this BTHW1. I do know its address. So I now paired it. I can connect to it. And then let's exit this thing. And like I said, so you can, with Blue also, you can have a look and it using the A to DP in SPC mode. And we can, of course, then also play some music, either with regular A-play, for example. You specify, like I said, this minus D device, Blue also, and you can use it just like any other PCM uh, device. Not. Or you can use speaker test or whatever thing. Not. Okay, that was basically it. And uh, let me see, 
Are there any questions? I also copied the whole uh, the demo stuff that, that you can see what, what it would be doing. Not. Questions, anybody? I know I run more or less out of time, probably. That would be it. If you have any questions, we can also uh, discuss it outside. Thank you very much.